So uh, just a word on our, our guest speaker then before we uh, kick off. So again, as you all know, uh, Gabriel's governor of the Central Bank, and he started this role in September uh, 2019, which is pretty amazing that uh, over two years already. Uh, so he's also a member then of the uh, the governing council of the European Central Bank and Ireland's alternate governor at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, so before joining the Central Bank, Gabriel was the Secretary to the New Zealand Treasury and the New Zealand Government's Chief Economic and Financial Advisor. And going back a little bit further in time then, uh, he was also with the UK Civil Service, uh, where his roles range from policy on domestic and international tax issues to the large-scale uh, delivery uh, operational political actions. Uh, so I, let me just sort of say on a, on a, at a more parochial level, if I can put it like that, uh, also having to say that Gabriel is a, a member of the Council of the ESRI. And uh, soon after he took up his role in the central bank, uh, I, I met with him and uh, I pointed out that there's always been a great tradition that the governor of the central bank had typically been on the council uh, of the institute. So that included some of the, the recent governors, such as Philip Lane, Patrick Conahan. Uh, but if you go back to the, the, the history almost of central bank, uh, including Bitterberg, of course, there had been this uh, strong connection between the, the institute and, and the central bank, partly reflected in the presence of the governor. Council. So really delighted that uh, Gabriel accepted our invitation uh, to become to come on the council, and uh, he's been a very active and uh, positive contributor since uh, then. So uh, Gabriel's going to talk for about twenty minutes, uh, and we will have some time then for Q and A after that. Uh, so if you want to start thinking about your questions and putting them into the Q and A function, uh, then I'll do my best to sort of moderate uh, that discussion a little bit later on. So with that, uh, Gabriel, I'm going to hand it over to you. And I know you've got some slides as well, I think, which uh, one of the colleagues is going to uh, share for you. So over to you, Gabriel. Thanks very much, uh, Alan. Um, I'm delighted uh, to uh, be here today, in particular to be here at the, uh, at the ESRI, albeit virtually. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, macroeconomic stability is one of the necessary foundations of a successful economy, necess necessary to promote the well-being of communities. As many of you know, macroprudential policy, both in Ireland and internationally, is a relatively young discipline, at least in its most recent incarnation as it emerged after the global financial crisis. And while macroprudential policy, like monetary policy, is a key, uh, uh, is, is a key in the element of an overall policy framework to achieve broad macro stability, it remains much less understood. Uh, which is hardly surprising. And like monetary policy, macroprudential policy doesn't have an easily observable target. And the panoply of potential macroprudential interventions entails a different degree of complexity when compared to the set of monetary policy tools currently employed by uh, central banks around the world. So I want to use today's webinar to explain in more depth our approach to and plans around the macroprudential policy framework in Ireland. I'll cover the fundamental rationale for an effective macroprudential policy framework, especially in a small open economy like Ireland, lessons from our experience of the days and our plans to advance and uh, mature the framework in the years to come as part of our new strategy. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Let me start with the origins of the at least modern version of macroprudential policy. The global financial crisis of 2007-8 imposed enormous costs on businesses and households around the world. At the time, the global economy saw the sharpest contraction in economic activity since the Great Depression. Trade flows and cross-border flows of capital collapsed globally, and millions of jobs were lost. Of course, the record for the sharpest global recession since the Great Depression has now been broken by the COVID-19 pandemic. But the costs of the global financial crisis have also been very persistent. Estimates suggest that even a decade on, potential output per capita across the OECD was around 3% lower than it might otherwise have been. And within that aggregate figure, there's significant variation across countries. Among the 19 uh, OECD countries that experienced a banking crisis a decade ago, the median loss in potential output per capita is estimated to have been around 6%. Sluggish investment was a key channel through which these losses and potential output manifested with long-lasting capital and productivity shortfalls relative to pre-financial crisis trends. 
The roots of the global financial crisis lay in the build-up of macro-financial imbalances in the preceding period. In the run-up to 2007-8, credit and asset prices grew rapidly across the world. Lending standards by parts of the global financial sector became excessively loose and borrowers found themselves with unsustainable levels of debt. Leverage of financial institutions themselves had expanded, as did maturity transformation across the financial system. The structure of the global financial sector had become increasingly complex and increasingly fragile. The global financial sector's balance sheet and its measured share of overall economic activity had increased dramatically. Many of these aggregates, uh, uh, many of these aggregate trends were visible in the early 2000s, but the global policy framework to achieve uh, macroeconomic stability prior to the financial crisis was not well equipped to deal with the buildup of risks. At a macro level, uh, central banks focused on achieving price stability through the setting of monetary policy. Indeed, in most mainstream macroeconomic models used by central banks at the time, the financial sector did not feature as a possible force, a source or amplifier of macroeconomic shocks. At a micro level, regulators focused on the safety and uh, soundness of individual institutions through supervision of regulated entities. The lens through which supervision approached its mandate did not take into account developments in the financial system as a whole, nor indeed how the collective behavior of the financial system could become a source of problems for the economy. Put very simply, in the decades prior to the financial crisis, there was too great a gap <clears throat> between macroeconomic policy on the one hand and the regulation and supervision of individual financial institutions on the other. So the crisis led to widespread reforms in the global financial system, from high levels of capital and liquidity for global banks to the introduction of resolution regimes for failing financial institutions to a more intrusive approach to supervision. But one of the key ingredients of the post-crisis reforms involved the birth of a new policy framework altogether, macroprudential policy. This entailed a shift in thinking by filling the space between finance and the broader economy. Macroprudential policy focuses explicitly on risks to the provision of services to household and businesses by the financial system, not on risks to individual financial institutions in and of themselves. It considers the resilience of the financial system as a whole, not just each individual node in the system. And it focuses explicitly on the interaction between finance and the macroeconomy, seeking to avoid adverse feedback loops between the two, such as damaging credit supply contractions or asset fire sales. Next slide, please. The development of the macroprudential policy framework in Ireland mirrors this evolution of thinking at the global level. But the nature of the Irish economy, a small, highly globalized economy within a monetary union, creates both unique considerations for the operation of the macroprudential framework and also underscores the importance of such a policy lever from an overall macro stabilization perspective. The Irish economy is one of the most open economies in the world for trade and finance. This openness is a core component of the Irish economic model. It has yielded uh, substantial benefits, evident most recently in the strong performance of multinational dominated exporting sectors, offsetting the impact of the sharp decline in consumption and domestic demand as a result of the COVID-19 health restrictions. Yet the benefits of a small open economy do not come without vulnerabilities and risks. The Irish economy experiences greatest pass-through from developments in the global financial cycle, which is one factor explaining the high volatility of Ireland's economic aggregates relative to other economies. For example, central bank research shows a significantly higher response of Ireland compared to large economies, such as the US, UK, and the Euro area as a whole, to negative global real and financial market shocks. And in addition to this greater sensitivity to cyclical global developments, the Irish economy is also more prone to structural macroeconomic shocks, such as abrupt shifts in international trading and tax arrangements. Again, Central bank research 
shows that growth prospects in small countries are more susceptible to negative shocks than larger, more diversified countries. Finally, being part of a monetary union means that macroprudential policy plays a particularly important role in the overall policy framework to achieve macroeconomic stability. There is the tendency for the financial system to loosen lending standards too much when times are good. In turn, this means that borrowers can end up with too much debt, leaving them overexposed in the event of adverse shocks. When those shocks do hit, highly indebted borrowers are more likely to cut consumption or investment, with damaging implications for the entire economy. This channel is likely to be especially virulent for small open economies operating in a monetary union as monetary policy has limited capacity to respond to local shocks to financial conditions. Moreover, the impact on aggregate demand when adverse shocks hit at a local level will be greater given the lack of an interest rate adjustment channel to stimulate the economy. These factors underscore the importance of an effective macroprudential framework in the context of the Irish economy. Put very simply, Achieving a given level of macroeconomic resilience in a small open economy that is part of a monetary union requires a more activist approach to macroprudential policy relative to a larger, more diversified economy with monetary policy levers at its disposal. Next slide, please. Now, given the importance of macroprudential policy in small and open economy, Ireland was proactive in the implementation of the new framework as the country emerged from the financial crisis. In 2014, uh, building on European-wide legislative developments, the central bank outlined its overall approach to macroprudential policy, covering, among others, the objectives of macroprudential policy in Ireland and the instruments available to the central bank to help achieve them. Our stated objectives for macroprudential policy are twofold. First, to safeguard the resilience of the financial system so that it can better withstand adverse shocks and continue to provide financial services to households and businesses. And second, to guard against the emergence of financial imbalances or vulnerabilities within the financial system. Now, with this uh, framework in place, the central bank began to introduce policies that aimed to build the resilience of the system as a recovery from the financial crisis broadened and strengthened. This phase saw the introduction of the mortgage measures and the capital buffer framework. It also saw the introduction of our financial stability review as the main vehicle through which we communicate our judgments regarding the main risks facing the financial system, the resilience of the financial system to those risks, and the policy actions taken to safeguard financial stability. So the first macroprudential intervention by the central bank was the introduction of the mortgage measures in early 2015. This is in the context of a recovering housing market following the boom and subsequent painful bust of the previous decade. House prices had quadrupled in the decade before 2007 and then fell for 20 consecutive quarters halving in value. By 2015, the economy was coming out of the financial crisis and this was the time of emerging imbalances in the housing market, with house prices increasing by around 15% year on year nationally, and by around 25% in Dublin, generally attributed to supply shortages. The objectives of the mortgage measures reflect the broader macroprudential policy objectives applied more specifically to the mortgage and housing markets. Uh, the measures aim to strengthen the resilience of lenders and borrowers to adverse shocks and to guard against the risk that house prices and credit evolve with damaging pro cyclicality To achieve that, the measures limit the proportion of new lending that can be extended by lenders at high loan-to-value and loan-to-income ratios. The previous crisis had uh, illustrated starkly the damage that can occur when loose credit conditions fuel house price growth and over indebtedness and the mortgage measures were introduced to reduce the risk that such a boom re-emerges in Ireland. Now the introduction of the capital buffer framework marked the next phase of the development of the macroprudential framework. The first buffer to be introduced was the so-called other systemically important institutions or OSI buffer which became 
operational across Europe from 2016. The objective of the OC framework is to reduce the probability of failure of a systemically important institution, given the potentially greater impact of failure of those institutions. The failure of one of these systemically important institutions will have a greater impact on the financial system and economy than the failure of a non-POSI. Higher capital requirements for these institutions in the form of OC buffers, therefore aim to reduce their probability of failure. We review the list of OCs and their buffer rates on an annual basis and announce the results as part of our financial stability review. The counter-cyclical capital buffer was a further element of the range of measures introduced in the aftermath of the financial crisis and also became operational across Europe from 2016. This buffer is a time-varying capital requirement which aims to promote a sustainable provision of credit to the economy by making the banking system more resilient. By increasing regulatory capital requirements in line with the cyclical systemic risk environment, the CCYB looks to ensure additional capital is in place to absorb losses when risks materialize. In addition, the release of the buffer during a downturn looks to limit the potential that regulatory capital requirements act as an impediment to the supply of credit in the economy. Now, our framework for the CCYB emphasizes the importance of introducing a positive buffer sufficiently early in the cycle to effectively promote resilience. Thus, when there is a sustained trajectory in indicators consistent with emerging uh, cyclical systemic risk over a period of time, we expect to maintain a positive CCYB rate. And we announced a positive one in July 2018 of 1%. Overall, until the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, the macroprudential framework was geared towards building resilience. The economic shock stemming from the pandemic marked the first test of the framework, both in Ireland and internationally. As the implications of this unusual crisis are still being felt across the world, we're still working through some of the lessons learned from the perspectives of the macroprudential framework. However, it's clear that we arrived in March 2020 with a much more resilient banking system than would have been the case in the absence of our various macroprudential policy measures and the wider reforms to bank capital and liquidity frameworks since the global financial crisis. Indeed, despite the unprecedented nature of this economic crisis, we did not see the banking system amplifying economic disruption. Going into this crisis, the Irish banking system had average uh, CT1 ratios, that's the highest quality of regulatory capital, of 19%. And the decision in Ireland to activate the CCYB at 1% in 2018 allowed for the rapid release of the buffer in March 2020. This release, along with ECB banking supervision announcements on usability of other capital buffers, enabled banks to absorb losses without a need to curtail lending supply. Now, turning to the mortgage measures, when the pandemic hit Irish borrowers were more resilient and better able to weather the shock. This higher resilience can be thought of as both a direct and indirect resilience. Direct resilience can be seen through the lower take-up of payment breaks, which were granted on more than 10 billion euro of mortgage debt. That's 11.5% of overall balance in the domestic banking system by mid-2020. Um, the indirect resilience relates to the role that the mortgage measures played in the preceding years in stopping credit dynamics from amplifying the price effects of the demand supply imbalance in the housing market. In summary, the mortgage and bank capital based measures meant the system, borrowers, lenders were more resilient when faced with a pandemic shock. Now, let me turn to some of our forward looking priorities around the development of the macroprudential policy framework. Last week, we published uh, the central bank's new strategy for the next five years. It's an opportune time to outline more depth our plans to advance the uh, macroprudential framework in Ireland in the broader context of our new strategy. Now, a key feature of the environment in which we operate and developed the new strategy is the pace of change. Of course, change in the structure of economies and the drivers of economic activity and in financial systems is not a new phenomenon. 
But a striking feature of the first decades of the 21st century is the increased pace of change. We're living in a time where people, capital, trade and ideas are incre increasingly and rapidly interconnected. And the pace of change has accelerated the evidence points of that continuing. From the perspective of the macroprudential policy framework, this means that it also needs to continue to evolve so that it remains fit for purpose, uh, not just now, but into the future. In a nutshell, I would describe the macroprudential framework, uh, not just in Ireland, but across the world, as still being in its adolescence. What we want to achieve over the next five years is to advance it towards maturity. Next slide, please. Now, what would advancing the macro uh, prudential framework towards maturity mean in practice? So there are four areas in particular where we want to continue making progress over the next few years. Uh, first, a, a key theme of our new strategy is to be more future focused. And in line with this, the first area of progress is advancing our approach to evaluating risks and resilience in a forward looking and systematic manner to inform the setting of policy. Now, like many macroeconomic policies, uh, macroprudential policy actions operate with a lag. So to, to, to achieve our objectives, we need to be in a position to reach forward-looking judgments around the magnitude of the risks facing the system. This is similar to how monetary policy is set with a view to future inflation dynamics and not the current rate of inflation. So a forward-looking approach is critical but of course that won't be easy. As you know, it's already hard enough for economists uh, to forecast the central case for the economy and seeking to reach a forward looking judgment on the magnitude of tail macroeconomic risks and the resilience of the financial system to those tail risks should they materialize is an order of magnitude harder. It will always entail much higher fundamental uncertainty. And we've been looking uh, to make progress in this area. Our modeling toolkit has evolved in recent years. We've been developing our analytical capabilities for understanding how financial conditions contribute to the uh, possibility of future episodes of economic growth. And we've been developing our approach to stress testing banks, borrowers, and non-banks. But our uh, analytical toolkit will need to mature further over time. Uh, second, further developing our overall macroprudential policy strategy. Macroprudential policy involves a wide set of instruments. Even within bank capital, there are different types of capital buffers. There are also interactions between measures aimed at safeguarding lender resilience and those aimed at safeguarding borrower or non-bank resilience. And macroprudential policy interacts with other policies, whether it's monetary, fiscal, or supervisory policy. In that context, it's critical that our regular policy decisions operate within an overall strategy for macroprudential policy that is coherent and transparent. So this will improve the likelihood that agents in the economy are in a better position to understand and anticipate our uh, reaction function, strengthening the effectiveness of our policies. And it will also enhance the ability of others to hold us to account for the policy decisions we make. Again, this is an area that we've been making progress on recently. For example, under the auspices of the European Systemic Risk Board, we've been working with colleagues across Europe to develop the concept and measurement of a macro prudential stance. Our understanding of the transmission mechanism of macro prudential policy will deepen, um, and our overall strategy will continue to be refined and developed. Third, a clear articulation of and continued progress on the measurement of benefits and costs of our policy actions. Like all policies, uh, macroprudential policy actions or their lack uh, entail both uh, benefits and costs for society. And our job is to balance these appropriately. Uh, we're not seeking to achieve stability at all costs. Um, there are particular challenges with both measuring and communicating the benefits and costs. Uh, in this area. I mean, the benefits mainly stem from the absence of developments that might otherwise have taken place. Uh, by contrast, the costs of macroprudential policy are more upfront and also visible. They might include lower mortgage transactions than might otherwise have been the case, or a somewhat higher cost of credit when times are good as the insurance premium for more 
resilient finance. While we will always seek to balance those benefits and costs, we need to continue to develop the way in which we measure and articulate them to the broader public. Fourth, ensuring our policy framework remains fit for purpose as the financial system and broader economy continues to evolve. No policy framework should ever remain static. For our policies to be effective, we need to review and develop the overall framework in line with evolution of the financial system and the uh, broader economy. Uh, one key dimension here, and that's something I'll come back to in a minute, is around the changing nature of financial intermediation and the growing role of non-banks, both in Ireland and globally. Uh, put simply, over the first decade of microprudential policy, the focus has been on banks, but uh, looking ahead, this won't be sufficient given the growing role of non-bank financial intermediation. Now, achieving these uh, outcomes will take time. It took decades, for example, for our monetary policy framework to evolve and mature. But it is a strategic priority for the central bank, and we're committed to making concrete, measurable progress over the next five years, working with and learning from our international partners. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. I just want to say a few things about the near-term priorities to help provide a broad roadmap of developments um, over the next 12 months. We are conducting a review across three pillars of the macroprudential framework, borrowers, banks, and non-banks. Uh, now, it's almost been seven years since the introduction of the mortgage measures. Um, it's prompted us to take stock and commence an in-depth review of the framework. Uh, while the measures are a permanent feature of the market, the operation calibration uh, of which we review annually, um, we deem a review of the overall framework to be good practice. Um, indeed, much has changed since the measures were first introduced. Interest rates have been on a downward path across the world uh, since the measures were introduced. Uh, the role of non-bank uh, financial institutions in the housing market has expanded. <clears throat> while housing supply has recovered more slowly than perhaps many people expected back in 2015. Um, a second theme of our new strategy, incidentally, is to be open and engaged. And in line with this, the first step in our review uh, of the mortgage measures was to listen to the public. And over the course of the summer, we launched a digital survey, uh, which we complemented with uh, listening events during July. The, the, the online survey has been the single most direct engagement with the public that the central bank has ever had. Over the course of the summer, we received more than 4,000 individual responses to our survey, which included more than 9,000 responses to the opening of questions. Um, the insights gathered uh, have informed the scope of our work. Um, and the review of the framework will run throughout the rest of this year and into 2022. Um, it's going to run concurrently to our regular annual assessment, which will be published uh, later this month. The wider framework review will explore the appropriateness of the, uh, of the, of the objectives, uh, of the measures, the choice of instruments, the framework, the strategy used for calibration, and so on. Uh, we're going to publish in December a uh, consultation paper on the overarching framework. Now, the second pillar of our work around macroprudential policy is around bank capital buffers. Over the past decade, uh, there have been uh, wide sweeping and rapid reforms of the overall bank capital framework, including the macroprudential uh, toolkit. Under European legislation, macroprudential authorities have the power to set a counter-cyclical buffer, which I talked about earlier, uh, additional capital buffers for systemically important institutions, uh, additional capital buffers for structural systemic risks, as well as various options for adjusting risk rates. This extensive toolkit entails benefits in terms of uh, allowing us to target risks in a more nimble manner. But the different tools means that there is an onus on us to consider how these interact together. At the end of the day, these are all different forms of bank capital that is there to absorb losses when shocks hit. So in the review, we'll assess how the different elements of the macroprudential capital stack are calibrated, 
how the risks being targeted by each buffer interact, and articulate our views on an evolution of capital through and over uh, the financial cycle. Uh, we'll further develop our uh, toolkit by enhancing our stress testing framework uh, for explicit macroprudential purposes. And we'll also take account of legislative changes arising from the transposition of the Capital Requirements Directive into Irish law. Um, um, in completing the review, we seek to have as clear, well communicated, and predictable a strategy as possible around our, our approach to bank capital from a macroprudential perspective. It'll allow uh, it'll both uh, allow us to explain our judgments better, as well as to allow the regulated entities themselves to plan ahead. <clears throat> and we intend to outline our thinking in this area uh, next year. Finally, uh, the third pillar of our review will consider the market-based finance sector in Ireland, and in particular, Irish domiciled investment funds. These have grown considerably in size and importance over recent years. Uh, for example, certainly relative to the size of the economy, but also in absolute terms, Ireland is one of the largest market-based finance sectors in the world. From a financial stability perspective, a key priority uh, internationally, actually, and indeed in the central bank, is deepening our understanding of the potential implications of a disruption in market-based finance on economic activity. <clears throat> the lack of a complete toolkit remains a key gap. And in that respect, European and international regulatory bodies have recently signaled the need to develop these tools for the sector to increase their resilience. Um, the exposures of the Irish non-bank sector are largely international in nature, but linkages to the domestic economy here have been growing, especially by exposures to domestic commercial real estate. And the growing importance of property funds as investors in the Irish commercial real estate market since the financial crisis has brought with it many benefits, including the diversification of financing channels away from domestic investors towards international investors and a reduced reliance on debt financing intermediated by Irish uh, retail banks. Uh, this increases risk sharing and reduces domestic interconnectedness. However, an implication of this trend is that it increases the sensitivity of the commercial real estate market to global shocks and that the resilience of this growing form of financial intermediation for the functioning of the overall uh, commercial real estate market matters more now than it did a decade ago. So over the coming weeks, we will publish a consultation paper on potential measures to limit leverage and liquidity mismatches in the property fund sector. These have a macro prudential objective. Uh, they'll aim to strengthen the resilience of this growing form of financial intermediation, uh, guarding against the risk that uh, vulnerabilities in the sector amplify uh, adverse shocks in future times of stress. Uh, we will proceed uh, cautiously, but uh, with determination in this area. <clears throat> I recognize that these are new policy interventions uh, with limited experience of their use, but it underscores the importance of the consultation. But I am uh, predetermined, uh, we are predetermined that the area of market based finance is one which we want to make progress in. The nature of the financial system is changing. And if we stand still, it's almost certain that our framework will not be uh, fit for purpose in years to come. Um, more broadly, given the international nature of the non bank sector in Ireland, the key priority for us is around the development and oper operationalization of uh, the macro prudential framework at a global level for non banks. Uh, that has to be an internationally coordinated. Uh, endeavor and I'm um, pleased that the uh, Financial Stability Board uh, is focused on addressing weaknesses in certain sectors of non-bank financial intermediation that were brought into sharper focus during uh, last year's COVID-19 related market turmoil. Um, let me conclude, making a difference for financial stability requires persistence and stamina. 
and developing new frame frameworks is a long endeavor, but it is a worthwhile one. The sector and society in which we operate uh, is changing rapidly, and so are the consumers that we serve. And to get ahead of this, and I think it's important we get ahead of it, we must become more focused on the future, be more front-footed and more agile. Uh, to be future-focused and become more open, <clears throat> we have to transform key aspects of the way we operate. But it's through monitoring and strengthening our frameworks that we will continue to uh, regulate financial services and markets effectively while ensuring that the best interests of consumers of financial services are protected. I'll stop there, Alan. I've uh, overshot my... Um, uh, my time slot, but I hope I've allowed a bit of time for uh, questions. No, absolutely, Gabriel. Thanks so much uh, for that, and no problem at all uh, about the level of detail you went into. And uh, as I indicated at the start of the the talk, uh, I personally found this a, re a really useful uh, way of, of gathering thoughts on on, on this issue. Um, a lot of people on the call may be sort of knee deep in this all the, the time, uh, but as you sort of touched on, this is a sort of a, an evolving and an emergent, emerging area uh, of policy. And uh, as you also said, because it's relatively new, people like me who sort of learned uh, my economics uh, quite a while ago, uh, it's always useful to sort of, you know, uh, to be re-equipping the toolbox or whatever like that and learning uh, about the new policy strands and everything like that. So I, I think that was really, really useful. So thanks so much for that. So uh, yeah, with your permission, we'll take a few minutes for questions. And I'm going to ask people uh, to send the questions into the uh, through the Q and A function, but can I just begin? And it's almost like let, let's get the first question out of the way because it's the same question that always comes up uh, when we discuss uh, macroprudential policy. Uh, and let me frame it like this: uh, I mean, at, at one level, of course, it makes an awful lot of sense that you want to sort of restrict uh, people from borrowing too much for mortgages and and from doing what previously happened. Uh, but I guess in the current Irish housing market where you have this very strange situation uh, that it is um, more affordable in some ways for people to be to have a mortgage rather than renting. I mean, the, the rent, rent has just become so expensive and continues to, to build up that isn't there an argument now to, to sort of say, well, you know, at the individual level, we're actually putting people under a huge amount of financial stress uh, because they're being forced to remain in, in, in the rental market. Uh, whereas if they were allowed to uh, actually get a mortgage, they could be making maybe what are more prudential financial uh, plans for themselves. So while uh, prudential, macroprudential policy makes an awful lot of sense, I guess some would wonder, well, was it designed for a world uh, in which renting was more affordable and that while you were renting, you had the capacity to build up uh, deposits, all of which are sensible things. Uh, but we've now got this very dysfunctional housing market uh, where rents are so huge that it's really making it difficult for people, in a sense, to build up their own capital buffer. So I'm kind of asking the question from a, a devil's advocacy point of view to a certain extent, uh, Gary, but as I said, it's the one that always comes up, so I thought I'd give you a few minutes to uh, to deal with it. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Um, and it's a very fair question. Um, and I think the the absolute root of the, um, of the solution uh, is a word you used uh, or a phrase you used yourself just now um, in posing the question, which was dysfunctional housing market. Because I should say, hopefully everybody on this call at least understands this, that uh, the, the central bank's macroprudential framework, the mortgage measures that we set, are not the solution to uh, Ireland's housing market. Right? I think let's that's, that's just hopefully everybody uh, at least uh, shares that view. Um, it's ultimately a question of supply, uh, but it is absolutely complicated. And I think it is a fair, I think part of what we're going to be looking uh, in this review of the framework um, uh, will include issues such as the one you just mentioned. I think it is a fair uh, challenge um, for us to look at. I mean, part of the, um, I don't want to get bogged down into uh, big levels of detail, but um, uh, the the current measures, just as an example, uh, allow uh, lenders to go above uh, the um, the core restrictions, the, what we call an allowance, um, 
And the allowances, in, in principle at least, uh, exist alongside banks as the, 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 their own credit um, uh, policies. <clears throat> and should, in principle, allow for flexibility to address the sorts of issues that you've, uh, the, the particular point that you've made. Um, now, we're not sure that's working as well as it could do. So that is something we are absolutely going to look at. I mean, I'm not saying that at the end of this review, um, the, the, there will be you know, material changes that will make the need for a deposit uh, irrelevant. I think that would be, you I mean, people, um, uh, would be wrong to assume that uh, you know we're going in that direction. But I completely recognise the issue, um, and it is, as I said, it is something we're going to look at uh, quite carefully as we uh, take forward the framework. Okay. Another issue I just want to raise, um, and it's it's you sort of teed it up nicely in the talk it's around the measuring the costs and benefits of macroprudential policy. And the way you sort of touched on it in your remarks, uh, you, you sort of talked in terms of, you know, the costs are often easier uh, to capture, be it through higher interest rates or more restricted lending. But in a sense, the benefits are sort of then more, more dispersed. And often the benefit, in a sense, is sort of avoiding uh, a catastrophe. OK, but let me put it to you in a more sort of political economy sort of way or a slightly different sort of take on it. OK, and a slightly different take would say the following, that central banks focus very heavily on the benefits of macro potential policy because that's their job okay so ensuring that there's sort of you know sound and sensible decision making and um, you know appropriate restrictions and everything like that i guess the emphasis is on the prudential and i suppose the the, the argument I, i've heard made on occasions is that given the role of a you know a, a central bank i mean in the absolute extreme of course the way to guarantee stability would be to have horrendously strict controls on lending, uh, you know, that, that we sort of, you know, didn't do much of the sort of thing at all. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the sort of the, the suspicion, I guess, is sometimes there that central banks naturally will err on the side of emphasizing the benefit of these sort of things and, and take less account of the costs. OK, and that could be in the case of the mortgage market that we've just been discussing. But also, if you think in terms of, of bank lending, uh, there's always that concern, especially after a crisis. Um, that there's a, a natural inclination to be uh, overly concerned about the prudent side of things, but, but to sort of uh, give less weighting to the bank, the fact that we need banks to be actively lending into the, uh, the economy to sort of fuel the sort of growth uh, that we need. So I don't know, is it possible to give any more of a sort of a sense of even currently how that calculation is done, that balancing of, of the costs and benefits? Um, you know, how does the central bank do this? And how can you give sort of assurance that there is appropriate weighting uh, on, on the cost side of things relative to, to the benefits that, that you as a central banker are, are probably going to have uppermost in your mind? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's, uh, um, that's a fair challenge. And I think one of the things that uh, central banks and basically anyone in the regulatory business, to be honest, needs to be uh, able to produce um, intelligible uh, cost-benefit analyses, in my view, as a sort of core uh, matter of principle. So we should be able to do that. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, as I said in, in the speech, actually, is we will continue to endeavor to do that as well as we can. The best place, uh, we, we bring all this together in our financial stability review. I mean that that essentially is the document where we we present our assessment of the risks and then explain the policy measures that uh, we are also putting in place to address those risks. Um, sometimes, you know, and we publish throughout the year. We publish papers and analysis uh, on this. Um, I actually do think that we need to do. Um, we need to make sure, not just we, but I mean the, the financial regulators uh, around the world, need to do the, um, the best possible job to make sure that the, these uh, costs and benefits are understood by the wider community. We tend to um, 
uh, write these assessments for ourselves and our peers and the firms that are more, most closely um, affected. But I actually think, partly for the reasons that I, when I, the way I started my speech, where I talked about the pace of change, I do think that um, uh, authorities, uh, whatever sphere actually they're operating in right now, need to spend quite a lot of time, probably more time than they have historically, to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and uh, that will involve you know, presenting a, a clear calculation of costs and benefits. I think the public, the community at large, with so much change happening so quickly, need to, um, they deserve actually, uh, to um, have explanations put to them, good communications put to them. I and mean, it's one of the, just digressing a bit, um, it was one reason why in the ECB's monetary policy strategy review, one of our, uh, one of the areas we looked at and concluded on was we wanted to improve our communication on monetary policy. But I think that's a sentiment that applies across the board. So uh, the FSR, let's go back to your cut, uh, to the chase on your question, <clears throat> the financial stability review, and we'll be publishing our next version in um, uh, later uh, towards the end of this month. We published two a year, so the last one was in June. The FSR is the best place to go and look and read our assessment of the overarching risks and the cost and benefits. Okay, let me take a, an, another question uh, from one of the participants. Um, so here's the question, I'll just read it out. So Andrea and Ria wants to see more harmonization between euro area countries in the way supervisors impose macro prudential buffers ensuring more consistency and imposition uh, of risk weights, loan-to-value income caps. So do you agree with him? So it's really, I guess, generally a, a question about international harmonization uh, on the sort of policy tools that you're talking about. Is, is it important and is it, is it something you're aiming to achieve? Uh, my very glib, somewhat glib uh, and quick answer is uh, yes and no in terms of my agreement with him. I mean, I think the more our uh, rules um, are harmonized, the easier they can be understood by all the players, especially players who are operating internationally. On the other hand, I think if a particularly important aspect of macroprudential policy, as I touched on in my speech, is um, that it needs to sort of uh, look at the uh, or, or, or take into account the local uh, financial conditions that are operating. So I think you know, macro prudential stance in, um, sorry, macro prudential policy in one part of Europe uh, may not be appropriate for us here in Ireland and vice versa. So I think we need, I think, I think the overarching framework needs to be familiar. I think as much, uh, harmonization, to use that word as possible, would be a good thing, but not if it led to inflexibility in the design of the policies themselves and how they were applied, because I think we would then lose one of the important benefits of having, um, uh, I think, the framework, which is to allow, certainly in the monetary, as I said earlier, in, the, in, in um, for an economy such as Ireland's operating in a monetary union. Uh, there's probably greater weight placed on being able to use macroprudential tools than there might be in another economy uh, which had its own uh, monetary policy, its own currency. Um, so, I mean, the other dimension to just mention is, and which I touched on, is when you think about the, you know, the new frontier, which is uh, macroprudential uh, policy in the area of non-banks, Frankly, that's only going to work uh, if there are a set of rules that apply across the world. So they have to apply globally. But again, they need to be flexible enough to um, be implemented in, uh, in domestic contexts because those contexts are likely to be different. 
Okay, we're, we're kind of coming towards the end uh, of our uh, session, but I've got to run the next question by you. Uh, it's a very, very direct one. So in your remarks in the coming 12 months, it sounds as if you're outlining a pathway to relaxation, both the mortgage measures, uh, I presume that's in both the mortgage measures and the capital framework. Is that a fair characterization? No, it's not a fair characterization. Um, might be wishful thinking on the part of the questioner, but... Uh, no, what, what I am outlining is uh, a genuine, um, I've been a believer, personally, I've been a believer in uh, reviewing sort of frameworks, um, you know, for, for many, many years before I even started here, even when those frameworks have been successful. And the mortgage measures have been successful. They have prevented... Um, you know, reckless lending, and they have prevented reckless borrowing. They have been successful. But when, when, when frameworks have been around, as, as those have, for six years or so, actually, notwithstanding that success, you do need to look at them and ask yourself, will they be successful for the next six years or so? Um, and uh, especially in a world where there's so much change. So... Um, I think what, what I'm signaling in, my ne in, the, in the next 12 months is the seriousness in which the people here at the Central Bank will be looking at how these things are working, recognizing some of the problems that, uh, as well, you know, the thing that, that, that you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Alan, um, um, in your first question, um, but also just looking at the growing, you know, my phrase, the new frontier, the growing uh role of non-banks um, in, uh, in Ireland. I mean, both in mortgage lending right through to just general financial intermediation uh, itself. So the central bank is going to do a serious job of work reviewing the framework, and people should not uh, take that as a signal that the sort of rules are going to be relaxed, uh, whatever that uh, phrase means. Um, okay. uh, we're going to use our best judgment to arrive at the best possible answer for Ireland. Okay, uh, so be before we end, there's a, a very different type of question. Uh, you made reference to the thousands of uh, responses to the online survey, and I'm just wondering... Uh, What's, what's the process to try and gather that information and, and make sure it sort of feeds into, uh, because again, as I'm sure it's something Central Bank hasn't sort of previously done. I'm just wondering about the, the, the mechanism to sort of distill the information and, and uh, have it presented to somebody like yourself and the, the commission to make, make some sense of it. Well, the, uh, we've had a sort of team of people here who have been going through uh, all those um, and uh, so I spent quite a bit of time um, analyzing them and reporting them to me and members of the commission. And we're going to, in the next um, uh, next month, uh, we're actually going to report back to uh, you know, the public um, with uh, um, an analysis of the feedback that, that we had. So uh, it was, uh, I mean, I was very pleased actually um, uh, with how well it went um, and the sort of quality of the responses that we had. Um, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, one of my ambitions for the bank is that we become much, much more connected with wider Ireland, not just with the uh, financial services sector. Um, and uh, uh, using surveys like that um, is one way of doing that, but I'm also keen, actually, that we, you know, once the pandemic allows us to do a lot more of this, that we spend time going out and talking to people, <clears throat> and in particular, listening to people, um, to better inform ourselves uh, as we do our job. Very good. Well, just uh, again, a, a small point. I, I do remember being at the, the central bank um, area at the National Ploughing Championship the last time it happened and being uh, very impressed with what was being done. And I think my uh, son at the time was even more impressed because he came away with free balloons and pencils and all the sort of things that kids love. <laughs> so you were you were well on the way uh, to achieving that of, of objective of engagement. Uh, so I'm sure that lots more is going to happen uh, 
in the coming months and years. So listen, Gabriel, thanks so much uh, for that. It's been a, a pleasure to uh, to host this event, and it's been really, really interesting. Uh, obviously, we'll we'll post the reporting on the SRI website, and I'm sure the central bank uh, will do the same. And uh, needless to say, we look forward to welcoming you back uh, sometime in the future to talk about the development of some of the issues you've been just talking about today. Thanks very much, Alan. And thank okay. you to everyone who's been here. Thank you. Sure. So goodbye to everybody and have a good day and indeed a good week.